Greetings. I'm Jackson Snyder, and this is part one of the autobiography of Bishop Daniel Ben Ragesh. After reviewing this installment, you'll understand why I call the series The One Who Got Away. Daniel's a very good friend and a colleague. He can preach, and he can sure tell a story. He consented to talking about his life, which is full of interesting stories, and I've finally gotten around to recording some of it for you. I hope you enjoy the tales of Bishop Ragesh. If you do, please subscribe so you can receive the infrequent updates in your email box. You can find us at www.youtubeone.org. Thank you. Them to really consider what they were doing and the fact that people were voting for the Democratic ticket. But, you know, one of the questions I asked today, I said, what do you know about living in a, a socialist country? Right. And I told them, I said, you have been living in a socialist country for 12 weeks now. I said, when you go to the store and you can't find your favorite package of pork chops, um, or you can't find your steaks, Oh, you can't find this and that. I said, this is what living in a socialist country is like. This oh, is what yeah. the Democrats are going to give you on November the 3rd. Absolutely. And, you know, going to the grocery, for one thing, mm -hmm. um, there hadn't been hardly anybody out in, except today. I went to the Walmart and people were in there from every place. Mm -hmm. But usually at the grocery, nobody's there hardly and the shelves are bare. And like if you want to get toilet paper. Mm -hmm. and, daily necessities. I went for a spray bottle today and they were all gone in every department. Yep. That's, that's what a social, day. and so I was trying to get, cause you know, and you know, I walked into the barbershop and I said, Hey, how we doing with that stimulus money? I yeah. said, yeah, that, I said, that's president Trump's stimulus money. It's a, it's a democratic stronghold and boy, they can't stand Donald Trump. Uh, I, I said, that's all. Huh? That's, they're brainwashed. I don't know what. Well, that 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 actually they're not as brainwashed as we think. When I had a very heartfelt discussion with them today, they could do nothing but say, "You know what, Brian? You're right. He's right. He's right about everything he's saying." I said, "You guys get the, the funny thing." When I had the uh, place a rolling today, I said, "Y'all done got that stimulus money." And I, you know, I, I talk to them different the way I, uh, than when I talk with us talking. And I can use adages yeah. and things that they would understand. And uh, they were crying laughing, but they knew I was right. I said, you could clown around if you want to. I said, in about a year or two, when they want that money back, I said, I hope you paid your rent. I said, make sure you pay your rent now. Uh, make sure you pay your utilities. Oh, they'll definitely want that back. They're going to want every dime. And boy, some of the stuff that I told them, they were rolling laughing because they know that I was right. You know, it's funny. I'm like, you know, I was working that room, and you could ask Governor. I worked that room like I was running for office, Jack. <laughs> and I worked that room like that because I'm very passionate um, about what I see happening. I don't know if you saw this interview, but there's an interview of a lady in New York City uh, that kind of told us what's going on um, and how she had to put her dead husband on ice. Yeah, I have seen some of that, loading people up in the vacant lots and in trucks. Yes, huh? yes. That's amazing. That hurt my heart. And it bothered me for three or four days, mm -hmm. that woman's pain. And, you know, I made it my business to tell people who are African-Americans, uh, people who are Hispanics, what's going on and what democratic socialism looks like. Because they don't understand. They really don't understand it. I'm like, you see these dead bodies? You see this person having to put the, uh, and you know, we're going to hear more stories as these, one of the reasons why I want everything to open back up 
is because I want to know what's going on in New York City. I want to know what's going on in Chicago. I want to know what's going on in California because these stories like this are going to come out. You're a political animal. I mean, you're, <laughs> you, you're one of the best storytellers that I've ever heard. Well, I just, <laughs> you know, well, I, I, I just repeat what I hear um, to the best of my ability and try to take something from it, something, try to learn something from what I'm telling uh, because, oops. Okay, your hand's raised. Okay. Um, I just wanted to see whether we were recording or not. Mm -hmm. So I basically, I, you know, the stories that I hear, the things that I see, I try to learn something from those things so that in the telling, like what I did today, I can tell that story so that I can reach people with a message, especially today. You know, I, you, to be honest with you, yeah, you know, yes, you said, you know, I'm, I like politics, I'm a political animal, but that's something that came to me in the 90s, okay? Um, I didn't like politics before, you know, I was a lifelong Democrat. Um, uh, raised in a democratic household. And uh, so that's what I did. You know, I, everybody's, you know, who are you going to vote for? I'm going to vote for Jimmy Carter. Okay. Oh, well, they, they, and they would go down there and they would vote for Jimmy Carter. Um, and then, uh, you know, the problems that happened with Jimmy Carter's presidency, we know them. Um, the gas prices, well, the really the gas prices started on the Ford uh, in 1973. But I remember the gas lines, uh, and I remember everything that was associated with that. As a matter of fact, I got a wonderful story about it. I don't know if I told you. But um, we were, you remember, I don't know if you remember the gas lines, but oh, yeah. you, w you went to the uh, pump uh, on your day. You had a specific day. Your zip code mm -hmm. had a specific day. Ours was 33054, Opalaka. And um, the day came for us to go. So I just happened to be home that day. So I had to go with the ladies, my mom and my sister, older sister. Well, everybody was up because they knew the importance of the issue. Uh, but I wasn't up. So they get me up out of the bed. They say, Baba, let's go. Let's get moving. Get your clothes Baba. on. Yes. Baba. Yes, that was, the, uh, that was my nickname, Baba. But I found, I'll tell you about that. I'll tell you about that later. So they're like, Baba, get your butt up. Let's get moving. We don't have time to play games today. We don't have time for you to walk in circles today. Let's move it. So I get up and I go take my shower and I'm still walking around in circles. So um, my sister come in and my mom will come in and they're thinking that I'm ready. Well, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to wear. So they fixed my wagon. Uh, one of them grabbed some shorts. The other one grabbed the t-shirt. They throw those on me. Then they go and they get this uh, pink robe and they throw me in that. And then they go and get me these pink uh, black woman shoes. By the way, the robe was a black woman's robe. They go up, they throw me in that. I'm like, whatever. Like they how get old these. were you? Huh? Five? How old were you? Uh, 1976, 1977, something like that. I know you're I think 50 it was, now, so yes. you must have been a uh, little kid. Yes, exactly. That's the point. That's why they were trying to move. So they put this uh, black woman's robe on me. They put these black woman's uh, uh, slippers on me. And then to add insult to injury, they decided to throw this uh, black woman's head covering on me. So I just got transformed essentially from some guy to a big, uh, this short black woman. And so they hustled me into the car and they shut the door and we go off to our gas station. It was called, it was the Gulf Gas Station. It was on 27th Avenue owned by a friend of ours. His name was Garcia Sr. And so we go and we get up, uh, what you call it. So they got me down there. It's kind of indiscriminate. So the number of the neighbors and our church folks could see us, could see us because if they saw me, 
it would have been disastrous. Everybody would have been mortified because trust me, I was mortified. And so I turned to them and I said, you know what? It would be fitting for you too if some white person saw me. True to the word, one of my schoolmates and their parents pulled up in the place and they're like, oh my God. So we get, I get down and they're like, put your head down. Don't say nothing because don't, we don't want them coming up here. I'm like, y'all getting just what y'all deserve. This, <laughs> yeah, so, sure. so at the end of everything, we go back to the house. I get up out of those ridiculous uh, African-American, uh, what I would call field hand clothes. And then I proceed to go on with the rest of my day. But it was one of the funniest things. We laugh about it now. I don't understand but, why, they, why they put you in women's clothes. Well, because I wasn't moving fast enough. So they grabbed the first, because remember, you, cannot, you could not be late. On your day, yeah. you could not be late. You see what I'm saying? Yep, I do. And if you were late, somebody got your slot. And you were out of luck until the next week. Mm -hmm. So that's why they're like, Man, put shorts on, put a t-shirt on, grab this robe, put on this uh, scarf and these shoes and let's go, man. That's essentially what happened to me because I was walking around, you know, whatever. These guys must not have lived long enough to remember those days. Yes, it was hard. Oh, yes, it was really, it was tough. It was, I mean, it was tough. You know, everything had to be accounted for. And uh, the funny thing is, they voted for this stuff. Uh, you know, people like those guys, they uh, they voted for this stuff. And then when the problems happened with Iran in 1979, tell you the truth, that 1979 was a bad year in Miami. It was 1979, 80, and 81. I happened to be looking in a, uh, um, over some film in preparation for this. And I looked at the some scenes from the Miami riots. Um, when they did my 50th birthday, they talked about, they showed some of those films. I don't know if you remember them. Yes, I do. Um, they showed some of those films. And when we had the problems with Iran, when we had the problems with the Miami riots, Arthur McGinn, the reason why those riots happened it was because um, an insurance man, a local insurance man, his name was Arthur McDuffie. Uh, he was murdered, uh, beat to death by six uh, Miami police officers. The crime was so bad until they had to move the trial to Tampa. They moved it to Tampa and these officers were acquitted of murder. Um, and I was out of town. I, I really think that my mother had the foresight and the spirit to send me to my aunt May and my uncle Dudley in Manhattan. Um, and um, I stayed up there for about two weeks. But when I returned, I returned in the middle of it. I'll never forget uh, landing in Miami-Dade County and seeing Miami on fire from the air. It was the most disheartening thing. And then to go from the airport to my home and to see our community literally on fire. So that that was a rough year. Um it was yeah it was it was a rough year. We had that we had the Marial boat lift we had another riot in 1981 and then we had another one in 1983. Uh, so you know, it, it, it was very bad. Um, th th that period was very bad. And, you know, the t I was watching it the other night, and I really felt bad because I look at the work that my parents and my grandparents did in building uh, that Bunch Park neighborhood. They built the Bunch Park neighborhood. Um, I remember hearing stories, um, my mom and my sister talking about stories about how uh, my grandfather and father were building uh, the Mount Hermon AME Church on that plot of land at the entrance to what will become the Bunch Park neighborhood. And I remember them doing that. I remember them talking about that. 
And I remember going to see the place after the fact, and it's a very nice place. It's still there today. Uh, Bunch Park is still there, although it's in chaos. But 1980 was bad because all his work, everything that those two had worked for, went, down. went up in smoke. Mm -hmm. Everything. And it never was the same thing. And he would die a year later. And it, it was tough. It was, it was tough to see that. I was watching that. Even now, it's tough to see that. I'm, I was telling the government, look at this. I'm like, this is my, this, this my grandfather's work. This is my father's work um, to build that community, the school, the church house, uh, all of the, the neighborhood homes and the, uh, the different stores on 27th Avenue and uh, all of this stuff, just poof, just like that. I take it this was like in what they used to call the black section? It still is, yes. Uh -huh. It still is. You And... I was listening to the news conference on the areas that, I mean, they had to send the National Guard in there. And we had people fighting with the National Guard, snipers, people burning and looting. And I mean, it was terrible. I, you know, it, <laughs> it, it reminds me of a, a friend of ours that um, uh, back when Trayvon Martin was killed. And, you know, Trayvon Martin comes from that same community that I was raised in. And as a matter of fact, the families know each other very well. Um, one of the guys that was in the courtroom every day, he played football at Miami New Orleans Senior High School with my nephew. And so we knew them. And when he was killed, somebody came to me and said, and this was on the Shabbat, this, you know, I started doing the Torah. We need to go down to the Miami-Dade County Courthouse. They're going to have a protest. And everybody's like, yeah, let's go down to the courthouse. I said, no, -uh. y'all can go down there, but I'm not going down there. And the reason why I didn't want to go down there is all of these problems that happen with these riots can all be traced to that for the, the, those steps at the Miami-Dade Courthouse. So you never know what you're going to be getting into either. If yes. You go in a place like that, you end up in the middle of something like that. Your possibility, you're not going to come out. Exactly, that's and that's what happened to a lot of. I mean, they went to the um, the courthouse that that day in 1980. They went there and they had this huge protest. Thousands of African Americans there, uh, Jackson. You can go on um, Channel Four News, uh, WTVJ. And you could see the protest at the uh, courthouse and you could see exactly how it started, how they started, they came out and they started lecturing the African-American community and it just blew up. I wonder how they started. What exactly were they protesting? Well, they were protesting the murder of a local insurance man oh, yeah. by Miami-Dade police. Uh, and one of those police officers came back and he continued to work. Uh, although he was in another uh, place, uh, he ended up working for Hialeah Police. Uh, but the other ones, I think they left Miami. Well, you know, one of, I think, huh? one of those policemen that I knew was murdered down there on practically on the courthouse steps. Yes. Mm -hmm. that, and her, my lay leader, co-pastor of my first church, that was her mm -hmm. brother. And yeah, and it, it, I mean, it's actually, it. actually, yes, one of those police officers did get killed on that step. I, I, I remember seeing that in the video. Yes, I do remember that. Oh, that's um, and, and that's when that's when the violence started. It just from down from that place, it just spread. I'm, I was looking over the map of how much area was covered. I mean, covered. I mean, think about where I lived. I lived in Northwest Miami Dade County. And so I lived in the northern part of the county. And then it spread all the way down to Coconut Grove and into southwest Miami-Dade County. That's a large area, Jack. Yes, Straight is. down and out because it, it spread over wet, out west even to Hialeah. That's a large area just torched. 
while you're on that subject, why don't you uh, reminisce a little bit about your involvement in the civil rights movement back early on? Because that was one thing that fascinated me. I think people would really like to hear about that. Okay, are you talking about my involvement or my parents' and grandparents' involvement? Your parents and your family and your involvement, because you, you've got your finger on the pulse of so many of these kinds of Okay, things. well, maybe that's where, first of all, I think it's important that people understand that I was not born into this family. I was adopted into this family. So this was a family that took care of foster children, uh, black foster children. And I came into this home uh, as a result of this. And so... You mind if I ask uh, what, what happened to your birth family? Um, we don't know. Even though I did, even though I, 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 I know their names, and I'll tell you, I did something real stupid one day. I called, you know, being stupid. You know, I just want to see what's up. Call somebody? Yeah, I called somebody in my birth family. And I called these people because this is, by the way, this is a well-known family, okay? My name is really Daryl Lorenzo Blackshear. Okay, mm -hmm. so the Blackshear name is a very well-known name. Yeah, down south, not only black people, but white people too. Yes, there's a lot of Blackshears. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we were being stupid and so I called, being dumb. And so I told him, I want to do a historical thing on the Blackshear family. So I want to speak to the matriarch of the family. And so they put the matriarch of the family on the phone. I said, okay, I want you to tell me who Betty Blackshear is. They hung up the phone. I'm like, ooh. Who is Betty Blackshear? Is that uh, Betty, Black, Betty Blackshear is my birth mom. Mm -hmm. um, now, I talked to somebody in Atlanta because the Blackshears, they stretch up this far in Atlanta. Okay. Um, and I, and he's, this person is a physician and he went to an HBCU and so we had a conversation and there's a connection there. Um, I felt it in the spirit that there's a connection there. And I started looking at all of these, uh, records. And so he's saying that there is a family, there's a, there's black, black shears up in Georgia there was another part of that family that went to Miami. Now the pe the group that went into Miami, they didn't do so well because what I did is I started looking up that name in the prison logs and they all looked like me, every last one of them locked up in the Florida state penal system. All look exactly like me. And so- All black I, people look alike. <laughs> no, no, well, no, there's something distinct. There's some distinct things mm -hmm. about them, and, 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 that, and that's my family. A friend of mine said, yep, look at the nose, look at the eyes. And we don't know. I know that the police brought me there. And you don't know if Yahweh intervened in that situation to remove me from that family. Oh, I'm sure. Okay. So he removed me from that, from that family. I thought it was funny. I thought it was funny because when I played the gig, you know, I'm just playing around. They hung the phone up on me when the name Betty Blackshear came up. Who is Betty You're, besides your mother? Is she uh, a well-known personage down there? I don't know. Mm -hmm. All I know is they didn't want to have the conversation. Okay. Okay. And so I'm thankful um, to the father for allowing me to get out. So I was brought into this family and I was adopted into this family. Uh, we didn't do it right away, but we did it when I would understand what was going on. So they took me into the court and they brought me into this courtroom and my mom signed the documents and when she signed the documents, I literally watched them 
kill everything concerning Daryl Lorenzo Blackshear. I mean, they rename you, they expunge your records, they destroy everything, everything. Okay, and so that's what happened there. So, so I was a doubt. Found again. Once they huh? the papers, they can't come and claim you again or come get you. So no, they can't. No, they, well, they, that's why they did that. Mm -hmm. You know, so they did all of that that stuff, and so I understood what was going on. I talked to the judge about it, and uh, they they went through the paperwork. Bang, signed with the county clerk's office. Bang. So Daryl Lorenzo Blackshear died at 10 a.m. At, on this date at this particular time, you know, mm -hmm. so that was the end of that. Now, let me tell you about this family. This family is a, um, it's, it's a good family. It's a religious family. Um, and they, as I said, they were very involved in the civil rights movement. My oldest sister, she knew what it was like. She went to Miami Northwestern Senior High School under segregation. Um, my mother, also born in 1920, August 31st, lived under segregation. And her father, which is my first babysitter, um, uh, Bishop James Forbes, uh, who was a uh, African, American, uh, African Methodist Episcopal Bishop, mm -hmm. um, he was her father and so he was involved in these things during the early years. You know, he also used to have a still in his did backyard. He yes, he did. And I guarantee you, if we go to his house right now, it's probably still there. It's not active, of course. Um, but he had a still, but, and it would be uh, 10 cents um, for you to have privileges at the spigot. If you, 10 cents for a cup, uh, I think it was five cents for half a cup, something like that. That's all you need. <laughs> and proof. exactly, exactly. And he, so he, that's how he ran the steel. But this was a place that wasn't just for drinking. This was a place where the community gathered around and this is where they read the family news. They read the community news. This is where they got all of the information. Uh, if the Ku Klux Klan was riding at night, that's where you learned about it. Okay. They had watchmen that they set up on the roofs of the houses uh, um, where you could watch and see if they were coming. Um, and so you could alert the community. And if need be, if they need to have a shootout, they had a shootout. Um, my grandfather represented people when they got in trouble with the law, uh, when they went to prison, and even when they were executed, you know. So my mother saw a lot and was there during a lot. She was a nurse, and this is, their, this is how they got involved in the civil rights movement. So a lot of people say, oh, Miami is this... Uh, uh, multicolored, uh, open society, uh, but that's not true. Miami was not an open, uh, 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 was not an open, it was not multicolored, and it definitely was not free if you were African American. As a matter of fact, you were not even allowed on Miami Beach after sundown. Oh, yeah. You went to Miami Beach to work, and then you came back home. Came back home. Exactly. So, my grandparents held political meetings at their home. Um, my grandma Ida and my grandfather. And of course, my mom was there doing the serving as well. And when she was up some size, then she also went to nursing school. And now she went to Booker T. Washington High School down there in Miami. And it's still around. Both of these schools are still around, by the way. And, but these schools were segregated schools, segregated black schools. And so they were very active in building a community. When my mother married, she married my father, and they built the Bunch Park neighborhood down there. They built it. That they was built in the, Miami then. Yes. Okay. They, they, they built that school. They built the school, they built the church, 
and they built many of the homes there, okay, and the businesses. So um, they were very active in the civil rights movement. They were very active in the marches. As a matter of fact, my mother confronted Jesse Jackson in 1981 when he came down there and proceeded to lecture the community about the uh, the conflict between the African Americans and the Haitians. And um, I'm not going to tell you what she said. Uh, it's still going on today. Yes, I know. But she stood up in that meeting and she told him, how dare you come to this community to be seen and to lecture us when we were right there and we marched with Dr. King just like you did. And how dare you come and lecture us now? And she basically told him, if you want them so bad, why don't you take them back to Chicago with you? <laughs> so, so my mother, um, she was a very strong advocate. She was a very good mentor to African-American uh, uh, females in the nursing industry. Uh, she was a head nurse at Jackson Memorial Hospital. And um, she taught many of these people. She was also a first lady in our church. So she really did a good job with mentoring people. And even though she's gone, there are people that still remember um, being taught by Sister Henry the things that they were taught. I mean, I remember her going out and uh, getting a hold of scantily clad uh, African-American women and redressing them and sending them home. Um, I remember her, uh, I don't know if you know about this group, Jack, it's called the Yahweh's. You remember that group? I believe so. They wore, they were, they were black supremacists. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they wore uh, white robes and their leader was um, charged with murder. I think it was back in 80, I don't think it was, yeah. it was 88 or 89, something like that. And he went to prison. He died in prison, didn't he? No, he, they, 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 no, he came home. He died at home. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he came at home. He came Yahweh home. Ben Yahweh. That That's him. Oh. That's him. That's the murderer. Um, and even though he didn't do it himself, but his people, then they saw it, and it was, I saw it. They shot this man to death right there on Channel 7 News, okay, over some kind of land dispute. But this group was very active in the 1980s after the Miami riot. They came to power. And my mother knew a lot of these people. And when their leaders would come, I have seen her walk out to meet these people and ask, what do you want in this community? Okay. And you know, those leaders always answered her, yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. She brought them in her house. They'd fry out fish and they'd sit down and talk because what she wanted, to, the God that they were talking about was not the God that she knew. Okay. So she wanted those people to explain that to her. And if they had explained it successfully, because this was a woman of distinction in that community, okay? My mother was not just anybody. She was a church leader. Um, she was married to a church leader. Her father was a church, huh? Let me interrupt, but there's a term you use that maybe people aren't uh, aware of, and that was first lady. Yes. You're talking about a pastor's or bishop's wife. That is correct. They take a, a real strong um, part of the assembly. Yes, they do. I know in the church I was in, they they told the wife not to take any part in it. But Yeah, but yeah, in a lot of African-American churches, the first lady or the elect lady, because um, uh, like I said, when she kind of retired, then she became the elect lady. Okay, in other words, she still uh, um, uh, functioned uh, from that seat of authority until she died in April 1994. Uh, but that is pretty much the person that people came to for advice. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, essentially, what it is, it's an elder. Okay, 
And they had very strong sway over leadership. Uh, they had very sway, uh, strong sway over community events. And that's why these leaders of the Yahweh Ben Yahweh's in that community, it was yes, ma'am. It was no, ma'am, because she told them. I'll never forget. She's like, yeah, you big now, but I, I remember you when, when we was cleaning diapers. Yeah, yeah. I'll still take a stick to your behind in a minute. So and that's the way she was. And she was a tough cookie, okay? And when I became a teenager, we didn't always get along. Um, and But I understand, and I got an opportunity to talk to her, and now I understand what she was saying, you know? And even then when I spoke to her, I now understand. Why is that? Uh, because of the way you turned out? As what do you mean? Where you came from? What do you mean? Well, you say you understand when later on you start to understand where, why she was doing as she was doing. Right. I didn't understand at the time. I thought, oh, you just being a meanie. Oh, you just this, that, and the other. And you just so hard. I'm always getting fussed at. I'm always getting read out, you know. But then I began to understand why. And the reason why she was hard on, harder on me is because the world in which I was about to go was not going to be kind to me. It was not going to be merciful to me. And it, was go it wasn't going to allow me to make the excuses like back in the back in the day, I used to get in so much trouble in school, and um, I'm telling you, I don't embarrass to them so much. But the point that she was making is, you're not going to be able to make these excuses as an adult. So Nobody you're kind of a uh -huh. hellion in school. A what? Yeah, I was a hellion. You're a bishop uh, now, but you were a hellion in school. Absolutely, <laughs> I was a hellion in school. I didn't listen. I didn't. I couldn't receive instruction, and I'm gonna tell you something. I missed out on a lot because of that. But sometimes you've got to go through that stuff so that you can learn. And you know, I started catching the understanding as a, as a young adult what she was talking about. Well, didn't something happen to you in high school that changed your life? Oh yeah, yes, yes, and that happened after. Um, no, it happened early. It happened in 1989. Uh, yes, I lost my sight as a result of a football injury. And I knew from her example, my father's example, my grandparents' example, that there was a God. See, at first when I was going to church and I would sit down there and I'd watch these people give testimony about the great things that God did in their lives, about how he delivered people how when the night riders was riding people would be caught out and how the father would hide people in the midst of the night riders okay how when uh bombs was planted in people under people's homes in miami and some of them did not go off okay i i i heard i enjoyed the stories i understood the account i enjoyed the accounts and I was, you know, mesmerized by this stuff, but I did not have a personal relationship with the Almighty. That accident, that accident brought me to an understanding. You know what? Your mother was probably praying the prayer, whatever it takes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. She probably did, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, because we, you know, me and my mother was separated for a while. Um, I went up to North Florida to keep me out of trouble because I was getting in trouble in Miami, okay? And my mother knew that they, she had to send me away from there. And, um, uh, you know, it was best because, I mean, I was in trouble. I mean, come on. The, I, when I'm running from the police. For sure. I'm running from the police. I mean, I would stole something from a store. The police department is running behind me, the Opelika police, and I'm laughing at the police, mocking the police. And I'm like, y'all can't catch me. I take off across 27th Avenue. All these people and that man was getting madder and madder and madder. But at the stoplight, there was this pastor, Hispanic pastor. 
And I run, everybody's watching the procession run across the street. And the father told him, go get that idiot before he get killed. So he tells the father, I don't know where to go to find him. Make a U-turn in the middle of 27th Avenue. Go down this side street and I'll show you where he is. So he goes down that side street. And he turned, he said, now turn here. He turns and he said, now sit and wait. Sure enough, here comes the procession down the street, me running, the police behind me, cussing me out, saying what they're going to do to me when they get their hands on me. And all of a sudden, he said, now stop him. So Pastor C gets out, says, stop in the name of Jesus. Everybody goes, ah, ah. <laughs> police stop, I stop, they stop. Why are you running from the call of the Almighty? I'm like, man, what you talking about? Why are you talking crazy? Man, I'm gone. And he stops me. He said, get in the car. Let's go back and take care of this. So I had to go back and take care of this. And we got things straightened out. So I moved to North Florida, um, St. Augustine. And that's where I started playing football, started wrestling, started running track, started getting involved and getting my grades together and really doing things right. And in that process, in this football game, you know, I had this accident and I lost my sight. Uh, they thought it was uh, worse than it was, but, you know, it still got my attention. The father got my attention, introduced himself to me in that hospital room when I turned my face to the wall and said, that's it. When he told me I wasn't going to be able to see again, I was like, well, if I can't see again, I don't want to live. Can you see anything? No. Uh-uh. I lost it all. Uh, and uh, you're always talking about being able to see this and that. In fact, earlier on, you said you you were looking over this and that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times it's kind of baffling because you say you're seeing this, or I've been over there and the television's on, and you're obviously watching it. But I guess what you're seeing is inside your head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you know, when I dream, I can still see. Mm -hmm. I can still see in my dreams. Sure. Um, that part hasn't gone away. And so I still remember things. Uh, like I remember what the the seal looks like in the middle of the field at Florida State, Docas Campbell Stadium. I remember what that's like. So I can it, I, I have that image in my head that's not gone anywhere. So uh, I, when I say I see things, and sometimes the Father will allow me to see things um, that I need to see spiritually. Well, you've seen, uh, you, you've spent a good part of your life seeing that. Mm -hmm. 16, 17 years of your life. So a 18. Okay, so when you are listening to, say, television or something, mm -hmm. imagine that you're seeing in your head what people actually look like still. That's correct. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, sometimes I could be wrong because I had an image of somebody and then I met the person, I'm like, that's not the image I had. Now, <laughs> so ever, that, that that has happened to me before. Do you ever need uh, to recognize people by, you see a lot of times on television shows about blind people, they get a hold of somebody's face and no, I don't know. I, I do no touching. No, I don't do any touching because I, I mean, in the day, the, the I mean, the days of Me Too and hair sniffing and all that kind of stuff, I'd be in real big trouble. <laughs> now, back in the day, once I first went blind, oh yeah, it was nothing to go into a club and oh baby, let me, you know, you know. <laughs> but I don't do that stuff no more. I don't. I I, I keep my hands to myself. Mm -hmm. Um, and that keeps me out of trouble. But no, it you know, the father really has delivered me from a lot of stuff and kept me out of plus. But going back to uh, my parents and, and grandparents for, for a moment, how they really took time with these kids that they mentored, that they um, saved. I, I'm going to give you an example. My mother, you know, I told you she was a nurse. And sometimes we would receive burn victims. I mean, give me an example. Sometimes this one parent, and I don't know how this parent wasn't executed because just the cruelty that you see in the foster care system, the cruelty. 
and this child was burnt uh, uh, all over her legs, Jack, all up her arms, uh, put in water, okay, hot water. By parents or guardians? By parents, by parents. Uh, and, and so they brought that child to Nana. That's what we call the Nana. And basically the way the system worked that she worked in is you came with to her house. You stayed at her house for an indeterminate amount of time. Between that time, they're dealing with issues in the court system. And sometimes you will stay permanently in foster care. Yeah. Or if rehabilitation is achieved, you'll go back to your uh, family. I was a foster father for several years, but I got to tell you, some of those kids were scary. Yes. I had some incidents in my house where I'd have a child go berserk. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to talk about it here. You're talking here, but some of them were scary. I finally had a, um, um, an experience with one I just couldn't get any more in. I was too scared. Well, my... um. My mother was lucky because she only had one real incident like that. And see, when you get them like that, you just call the social worker, they come and pick them up, and that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. That's the way that works, day or night. And so we didn't have many discipline problems uh, with the people that we worked with. And so this lady, this person was brought to Nana's house. And she stayed with us for six months. I'm going to tell you something. Don't you know, when Yolanda left our house, my mother patiently got those Job stockings out, and she worked with that child, even though it was painful, poor child. Job stockings? Job stockings is what they used for uh, bird victims back then. Oh, oh okay. Okay, and she put the oil and stuff on them and she'd work them, you know, they have to do therapy and stuff. She'd work with them with her hands and she'd uh, do what she needed to do. And when that lady left, you could not tell that she was burned. Through prayer and doing her therapy and her exercises and doing what she needed to do, that child recovered. Where else would a child with that kind of problem get that kind of therapy? I mean, this this doesn't happen often in foster. No, not well. They well, they they do skin grafts and stuff, but this child did not need skin grafts. Mm -hmm. This child, like I said, this comes from a loving woman, a woman of service. I call her a woman of valor, because that's what she did. She dedicated her life to serving the community. There was another person that they brought there um, uh, where the parents had took the child and bashed the child head on the, on, on the table. Uh, Shimona Thomas was her name. And they had her there. She was there for two years. I heard and saw that Shimona, and she, she, was, uh, uh, she was not able to walk. She wasn't able to talk. She wasn't able to do any of that stuff. But when I heard and I saw Shimona next, Shimona was able to talk a little bit, and Shimona was able to walk. What do you attribute that to? Fear? I, the, the same thing. Exercise, uh, godliness, and prayer, and sanctification of these people. Uh, my mom, she really worked hard with those children and she took issue by issue and she really worked with those individuals. Now, of all of the foster children that came that my mother served, she only kept two. Me and my younger sister, Michelle. Um, and Michelle was a preemie, and um, she spoiled a rotten. <laughs> when she came in, she was a newborn when she came in. Mm. The two that she kept were newborns. Okay, mm -hmm. 
The two that she came in was rescued. Okay? Yeah. So she kept us. We probably was the worst of the bunch, but she kept us just the same. <laughs> well, I'm and, glad she did. Huh? I'm glad she did. Look oh, at man. Day, you're not among the black shears in prison someplace. Exactly. I mean, it's a whole, not, not all of them are bad people. But what I'm saying is that there are some people then there that are kind of rough. And yes, well, I could know, have been. They're cold too. You know, yes. When, when they grow up in a horrible environment, what do you expect? Exactly. I mean, you should see them, I and they all look like me. They're all big and got this mean looking face. They all look mean. Every last one of them. Right there next to each other in um, Wayne Browns. Let's, go, let's get a reunion going. Well, absolutely not. <laughs> You know, I, uh, in the 90s, I had that thing of wanting to do that. Sure. But the father has really calmed me down and said, and just really assured me that he has me where he wants me. Okay? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you could feel alone sometimes without family because, you know, our family, it, it, while it has done a lot in the civil rights era and stuff like that, Everybody still does their own thing. It's not as there, there as it could be. And especially in my immediate family, a lot of them have turned away from God. Even though it was God that extended them mercy. It was God that extended them kindness. And a lot of them were really protected and cared for by this lady. And when she passed away in April 94, they all went off the rails. They went crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you ever heard of embarrassing tales of people falling into the grave? You oh, had no. people at, people in my family, they were so they were carrying on so bad. I wanted to tell them to put the casket on top of these people and let's go home. I never saw it, but certainly uh, some of the... the places in the hospital, especially when I ministered to black families that were involved with the church. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just antics like uh, somebody wanted to just be dead too. Just <laughs> Exactly. Oh, I want to go with her. I want to go with her. I'm like, the hell no, I don't. <laughs> I don't want to go nowhere before it's my time. So other ones would go off, when you say off the rails, they'd go back to the slot, hog slot. They, they, they'd end up back in the world, even though they were raised in the uh, uh, the uh, in the religion of the Church of God in Christ. Uh, they were raised in the faith. Um, they tended to go back and become worldly. They just quit mm -hmm. because the person that made them do what was right uh, that made them serve in church, that uh, showed them how to serve, um, had passed away. Well, I it, mean, it didn't really take for them in order to transfer their reliance on the Almighty. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And the person that everybody expected that it would not take was the person that it took, and that was me. Mm -hmm. That was me. And that's what happened. I was the one that held on to the Almighty. I was the one that reached out to the Almighty. I'm the one that in spite of the obstacles that I've been doing over the past 20 years and walking in this Messianic movement, I still hold on to the Almighty because I, I look past um, the people. I look past the people. I mean, we talk about some of the things that I experienced in a certain ministry. Um, I had to look past that individual to realize that oh, yeah. the father is the one that I need to look to. That's my mom and that's my dad. Um, I can't look to individuals who don't know what that means. Well, you went from uh, what I would consider uh, a liberal church Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's a fundamentalist, but it's quite liberal into Torah centrism. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Well, it was, I think it was my love for, uh, well, here's how, here's how it went down. I went to Florida State University 
and Florida at, at Florida State, you know, uh, I, because of my accident, I did a lot of things late. Uh, I had to take some years to get myself together, to rehabilitate myself, uh, learn how to read, learn how to write, learn how to walk and do all those kinds of things all over again. So that set me behind the eight ball. So I went to Florida State uh, late and I wanted to do all of the things that I missed out on, like pledging a fraternity, uh, being involved in, on campus, uh, doing this and doing that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I joined a Jewish fraternity in college. And so I began to get exposed to the, to the Torah. You joined uh, a Jewish fraternity? Yes, I did. How did you... I, is that the, that's the one that would take you or no it's that you found people in there that liked you because see the way rush works mm -hmm. look if they don't like you you don't get in there now what i could have done i could have joined a historically black fraternity and been done with it i could have been an alpha i could have been a member of omega sci-fi um i could have been uh ak sci i could have done all, any of that stuff but i chose to do something that was different and that's what the uh, checked out the ifc fraternities but usually when you join an IFC fraternity, you're going to be what they would call the token nigger. Were there okay. other blacks in there? Uh, yes, there were other blacks in these fraternities and that we would call them token Negroes. And so, but I wanted to join a fraternity that I could be active in. I wanted to be the first African-American to do this. I wanted to be the first African-American to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to Rush. They, they liked me. So I came back and eventually I was invited to join. It's a process. You don't just show up there and they take you. Right. And so uh, I went through the, I went through the process. It was 16 weeks. Um, and, you know, I became a member of that fraternity, but we started, I started learning about Shabbat, started learning about the Moedim, started learning about clean eating okay started they learning would about take you in if you didn't have a background in judaism exactly they cut corners that's about that is the point that's called the, what i believe is divine favor i would say so okay and who knows if this is not the environment that the father was using as a matter of fact they were trying to get me to convert that was the next thing that was about to happen I have gotten three invitations to convert to Judaism, rabbinic Judaism. I don't think that would have worked. No, well, it, it probably, it, it, I would have had to deny everything. And I was, I'm just not willing to do that. I'm sorry. I was taught too well that I'll use this word, quote unquote, Jesus Christ came, he died. He rose from the dead and he's coming to judge the quick and the dead. So. Uh, I knew too much about that to do that, but I've gotten that opportunity, but I started to ask questions, particularly about the difference between Easter and Passover. I said, what's the difference? They asked, what's the difference? I'm like, uh-oh, the Jews are asking the questions mm -hmm. and I'm asking the same question. We need to find out. So I realized that Easter and Passover are the same thing. And if they are the same thing, then what am I doing out here doing Good Friday, Saturday, Easter egg. yes, East egg hunting, ham eating, clam bacon, pork eating. What changed if Jesus Christ came he died he came to fulfill the torah what am i doing why am i doing this and so that's where it started that's why i said i need to search and find out this term messianic jew and so that's why i started searching i went into a messianic jewish congregation that was there in tallahassee it was a very good congregation, but then I got invited because at this time I was also feeling homesick. 
I felt that I was away from my family. I felt a disconnect from my family and I wanted to come home. And so I started making arrangements to come home. So I joined this program, it was a national program called uh, VISTA. Yes. And I came home to VISTA, I came home to Miami. Uh, and I realized that Miami had changed. That wasn't the same Miami. And so I had to look for a place to worship. I was invited to worship at a rabbinical school over there in um, North Miami Beach and Aventura. Uh, but I thought, no, I need to find something like what I'm used to. Somebody put me in touch with a person at a certain place. And the person called, I, you know, I called and they were very nasty to me, very rude. And I said, how would I get to the city code? They said, you know what they told me? Well, you better call special transportation and they hung up the phone. Mm -hmm. Somebody, another person called me back and I shouldn't, I, if I knew any better, I would have never picked up that phone. Was that a messianic uh, or just uh, orthodox? No, it was a messianic. No, the orthodox wanted me to come and stay. Yeah. But the messianic, you know who the person is. Uh, I mean, it was uh, a certain person that you and I both know. It was his people. And they were very rude and very nasty. But then somebody that had a heart called and said, we'll pick you up. And so I stayed there for 11 years and I went through a lot of stuff out there. Some of it my fault, some of it not. That's pretty but amazing. If that person hadn't called, you probably wouldn't be there right now. I'd probably be, I'd probably be in rabbinic Judaism. Mm -hmm. I'd probably, if he had to call back, after realizing the mistake that they made, I would probably be in rabbinic Judaism. Did the same person call you back? No, it was a different person. Different person. Yeah, it was a different person. Somebody that heard about it and called back. And so I ended up in that place. And like I said, I was there for a long time until I moved up here to Tennessee. Hmm. And then um, I, I was there for about a year. And now I'm here. Uh, just like I said, just serve, trying to find a place to serve. I'm thinking that was five, six years ago, maybe. Oh, uh, that I moved to Tennessee? Yeah. Yeah, that's about right. That's about right. And um, like I said, it, it really is about just trying to find a place to serve. You know, I, you know, service is in my heart. So I try to find a place to serve and I try to get in where I can help. I try to get in, try to build. And that's not always been received well. Well, uh, by others. The subject, our time's just about up now for this session. Mm -hmm. I want to hear what you're trying to do now. That would be a good way to end the first, second session. Well, basically what I'm trying to do, I am pushing towards the ancient ways of our fathers. I'm trying to push back to, towards the first century. And, you know, the Yahad is really responsible for that. Um, you know, that alb really stands out to me, okay? You know, I used to laugh at the Catholics and pick at the different people. I look at them in their little dress, mm -hmm. okay? Because you know that uh, Anglican dress is the rocket, the Shamir, the tippet. Um, but... I never thought about where this stuff comes from. Yeah, it's what Jesus wore. Exactly. So I'm like that. I'm like, if that is something that they wore in the first century, what the heck are we doing? So now I'm pushing back towards the first century. And I'm like, we've got to have it. We need it. And we need to strive for it. And so that, so I want to build a, an assembly that mirrors that it's not going to be perfect because it's, we've lost so much, but we can mirror that image of the first century where we are having services with, litur with liturgy and allowing for the free, free flow of the gifts of the spirit. If you play music, come on in, we'll let you play. Uh, it, it, you know, if you want to serve, come on in. I mean, service is welcome. 
Don't you have to do a lot of research for that? I mean, churches certainly don't go back to the first centuries and rabbinics don't either. No, but you can, you can at least go back to something that you can work with. Um, you know, there's, there's some stuff. research in this. Yes, there's a lot of research that's been done. And a lot, there's a lot of things that are out there, churches that are already active doing some of this stuff. They just don't realize what yeah, they're doing. Right. They don't know it. I mean, some of these old churches like the uh, Catholic Church or the uh, Orthodox Church or the Episcopalians, we got to find out where they went wrong. Grab their stuff. I told you about this Presbyterian church that I went to over here in town and uh, the guy got up there um, and started doing the, uh, the the communion liturgy. And I just sat up, strut up, strut up. Like, Wait a minute. That's the hard liturgy. That's right. It's and I'm like, this is what I'm talking about. This is the thing. You know, the, the, the messianic body is so divided that it cannot get its legs under. But the reason why it's divided because the stuff has already been done. It's been done by the um, by the Presbyterian Church. It's been done by the Episcopalians. It's been done by the Catholics. It's been done by the Orthodox. We need to grab a hold of whatever they have, and that means not being afraid if you're in the clergy to don the Anglican garb of my grandfather, to don the Anglican garb of my father, you're to don right. the Anglican garb of whatever. You're making people that are in Hebrew roots type Judaism upset about it. That's they good. Upset. They get upset. That's good that they're getting upset because I personally believe that Hebrew roots is off. They're teaching this one man uh, uh, congregation style. That's not what they did in the first century. No. So if your premise is wrong, your conclusion is going to be wrong. And that's what we need to push back to. And I know a lot of people have issues because of the abuse of clergy, the abuse of leadership. But one of the things, if anybody should be angry with the system, it's me. The system threw me away from day one. The system kicked me from pillar to post from day one. But in still, yet in still, through the prayers of my parents and grandparents, I held on to the fact that there is a need for instruction in leadership. And without that, we are not going to make it. Because I'm going to tell you something. There is a king coming. There is a kingdom coming. And if we think that we're going to run around like wild Indians in the kingdom, it's not going to happen. We're practicing. You're not going to be able to turn on a light switch and you change. We have to practice now. And so that's why we need to press toward the mark of the high calling and press back to the assembly of the first century. Exactly. Show them where we're going to make it. Mm -hmm. Sure, they messed up. Do they got faggots in the, in the leadership? Absolutely. Do they abuse children? Absolutely. But they're going to be punished. But we have got to understand that Yahweh has an order. He gave, the, we see it in the Dodonke. We see it. He taught the 12 certain things. And those things are supposed to be carried all, carried forward. Of course, rabbinic Judaism got a hold of the documents and the Catholic Church got a hold of the documents and everybody's put their paws on it. It's but, yeah. Exactly. But, the, but they're documents that we can still get something from. Absolutely. Why aren't we going back to those things? Mm -hmm. Uh, while we're on the subject here, before we close up, tell us where you are. Where I mean where I am? Geographically. I live in the great state of Tennessee. Uh, I live in Cleveland, Tennessee, mm -hmm. a headquarters of the, uh, uh, the Church of God Cleveland Assembly. And I also live in the Tennessee Valley where there's a lot of Messianic believers, a lot of Messianic places. Bill Cloud's here. Steve Bergson's here. Uh, every other Messianic is here. Are you working <laughs> toward having an assembly there? And, and it's yes. When? Yeah, huh? When? Well, we already well, started. I live there that listens to this on YouTube. And mm -hmm. 
you might have somebody wonder in if we knew exactly that. well if you if you want to participate in this vision please give me a call at 423-790-1651 that's 423-790-1651 or you can send me an email at bishop regesh at gmail.com that's b-i-s-h-o-p r-e-g-e-s-h at gmail.com and we can get you into uh, a place where you can come you can contribute without feeling judged and you can be part of the solution and not part of the problem well we got a uh, we've got a um, podcast going now don't we too Yes, there there is a podcast, the Yet Cast. Uh, we are doing. We're going. We're getting ready to be doing. We're going to be doing some new things here soon. But we have a lot of podcasts up going. Yet dot yet yetcast dot com. That's yetcast dot com, and you can see all of our podcasts. Don't you do an online service as well? Um, there is one. No, I don't do an online service. I do a local service. Our service is at uh, four p.m. Uh, every Shabbat, and that'll be that's followed up by an Oneg and fellowship time. So, seems like I've heard you on uh, eleven o'clock or so. Oh my goodness! <laughs> yes, we have we do have our uh, New Earth Restoration Ministries uh, Shabbat services every week, eleven a.m. sharp. We have. Uh, different elders and teachers that come on, they teach, and they have very wonderful inspirational messages. We also have an online forum at 1 p.m. And we uh, get in there and we hash it out. We talk about different issues. And if you're into that, you can come and enjoy. If you are, this information will be on the end of this video or in the show notes. And Amen. I want to thank you, Bishop Ragesh, for finishing up with our first time together. Mm -hmm. uh, looking forward to some of the other stories that are coming. Uh, oh, yeah. I think we should probably do three. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I've heard so many stories from you. I've never heard those stories, though. <laughs> the rest of them. Thank you very much. Thank you.